By listening to this short ad, you are supporting our podcast. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There is creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Part 2. If Moses was an Egyptian. In part 1 of this book, I have tried to strengthen by a new argument the suggestion that the man Moses, the liberator and lawgiver of the Jewish people, was not a Jew but an Egyptian. That his name derived from the Egyptian vocabulary had long been observed, though not duly appreciated. I added to this consideration the further one that the interpretation of the exposure myth attaching to Moses necessitated the conclusion that he was an Egyptian whom a people needed to make into a Jew. At the end of my essay, I said that important and far-reaching conclusions could be drawn from the suggestion that Moses was an Egyptian, but I was not prepared to uphold them publicly, since they were based only on psychological probabilities and lacked objective proof. The more significant the possibilities, thus this earned the more cautious is one about exposing them to the critical attack of the outside world without any secure foundation, like an iron monument with feet of clay. No probability, however, seductive, can protect us from error. Even if all parts of a problem seem to fit together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, one has to remember that the probable need not necessarily be the truth, and the truth not always probable. And lastly, it is not attractive to be classed with the scholastic and Talmudists who are satisfied to exercise their ingenuity unconcerned how far removed their conclusions may be from the truth. Notwithstanding these misgivings which weigh as heavily today as they did then out of the conflict of my motives, the decision has emerged to follow up my first essay by this contribution. But once again, it is only a part of the whole and not the most important part. One, if then Moses was an Egyptian, the first gain from this suggestion is is a new riddle, one difficult to answer. When a people of a tribe prepares for a great undertaking, it is to be expected that one of them should make himself their leader or be chosen for this role. But what could have induced a distinguished Egyptian, perhaps a prince, priest or high official to place himself at the head of a throng of culturally inferior immigrants and to leave the country with them is not easy to conjecture. The well-known contempt of the Egyptians for foreigners makes such a proceeding specially unlikely. Indeed, I am inclined to think this is why even those historians who recognize the name as Egyptian and ascribed all the wisdom of Egypt 
to him were not willing to entertain the obvious possibility that Moses was an Egyptian. This first difficulty is followed by a second. We must not forget that Moses was not only the political leader of the Jews settled in Egypt, he was also their lawgiver, an educator, and the man who forced them to adopt a new religion, which is still today called Mosaic after him. But can a single person create a new religion so easily? And when someone wishes to influence the religion of another, would not the most natural thing be to convert him to his own? The Jewish people in Egypt were certainly not without some kind of religion. And if Moses, who gave them a new religion, was an Egyptian, then the surmise cannot be rejected that this other new religion was the Egyptian one. This possibility encounters an obstacle, the sharp contrast between the Jewish religion attributed to Moses and the Egyptian one. The former is a grandiously rigid monotheism. There is only one God, unique, omnipotent, unapproachable. The sight of his countenance cannot be born. One must not make an image of him, not even breathe his name. In the Egyptian religion, on the other hand, there is a bewildering mass of deities of differing importance and provenance. Some of them are personifications of great natural powers, like heaven and earth, sun and moon. Then we find an abstraction such as Ma'at, justice, or truth, or a grotesque creature like the dwarfish Bess. Most of them, however, are local gods from the time when the land was divided into numerous provinces. They have the shapes of animals, as if they had not yet overcome their origin from the old totem animals. They are not clearly differentiated, barely distinguished by special functions attributed to some of them. The hymns in praise of these gods tell the same thing about each of them, identify them with one another without any misgivings in a way that would confuse us hopelessly. Names of deities are combined with one another so that one becomes degraded almost to an epithet of the other. Thus, in the best period of the new empire, the main god of the city of Thebes is called Amun-Re, in which combination the first part signifies the ram-headed city god, whereas Ra or Re is the name of the hawk-headed sun god of On. Magic and ceremonial amulets and formulas dominated the service of these gods as they did the daily life of Egyptians. Some of these differences may easily derive from the contrast in principle between a strict monotheism and an unlimited polytheism. Others are obviously consequences of a difference in intellectual level. One religion is very near to the primitive, the other has soared to the highest of sublime abstraction. Perhaps it is these two characteristics that occasionally gave one the impression that the contrast between the mosaic and the Egyptian religion is one intended and purposely accentuated. For example, when the one religion severely condemns any kind of magic or sorcery which flourishes so abundantly in the other, or when the insatiable zest of the Egyptian for making images of his gods in clay, stone, and metal, to which our museums owe so much, is contrasted with the way in which the making of the image of any living or visionary being is bluntly forbidden. There is yet another difference between the two religions, which the explanations we have attempted do not touch. No other people of antiquity has done so much to deny death, has made such careful provision for an afterlife. In accordance with this, the death god 
Osiris, the ruler of that other world, was the most popular and indisputable of all Egyptian gods. The early Jewish religion, on the other hand, had entirely relinquished immortality. The possibility of an existence after death was never mentioned in any place, and this is all the more remarkable since later experience has shown that the belief in a life beyond can very well be reconciled with a monotheistic religion. We had hoped the suggestion that Moses was an Egyptian would prove enlightening and stimulating in many different respects. But our first deduction from this suggestion that the new religion he gave the Jews was his own. The Egyptian one has foundered on the difference, nay, the striking contrast between the two religions. Two, a strange fact in the history of the Egyptian religion, which was recognized and appraised relatively late, opens up another point of view. It is still possible that the religion Moses gave to his Jewish people was yet his own, an Egyptian religion, though not the Egyptian one. In the glorious 18th dynasty, when Egypt became the first time a world power, a young pharaoh ascended the throne about 1375 BC, who first called himself Amenhotep IV, like his father, but later on changed his name, and not only his name, this king undertook to force upon his subjects a new religion, one contrary to their ancient tradition and to all their familiar habits. It was a strict monotheist, the first attempt of its kind in the history of the world, as far as we know, and religious intolerance, which was foreign to antiquity before this and for long after, was inevitably born with the belief in one God. But Amin Hotep's reign lasted only for 17 years. Very soon after his death in 1358, the new religion was swept away and the memory of the heretic king proscribed from the ruins of his new capital which he had built and dedicated to his god and from the inscriptions in the rock tombs belonging to it we drive the little knowledge we possess of him everything we can learn about this remarkable indeed unique person is worthy of the greatest interest everything new must have its roots in what was before. The origin of Egyptian monotheism can be traced back a fair distance with some certainty. In the school of the priests in the Sun Temple at On Heliopolis, tendencies had for some time been at work developing the idea of an universal God and stressing his ethical aspects. Ma'at, the goddess of truth, order, and justice, was a daughter of the sun god, Rai. Already under Amenhotep III, the father and predecessor of the reformer, the worship of the sun god was in the ascendant, probably in opposition to the worship of Amun of Thebes, who had become over prominent. An ancient name of the sun god Atun or Atum was rediscovered, and in this Atun religion the young king found a movement he had no need to create, but one which he could join. Political conditions in Egypt had about that time begun to exert a lasting influence on Egyptian religion. Through the victorious sword of the great conqueror Tohutmus III, Egypt had become a world power. Nubia in the south, Palestine, Syria, and a part of Mesopotamia in the north had been added to the empire. This imperialism was reflected in religion as universality and monotheism, since Pharaoh's solicitude now extended beyond Egypt 
to Nubia and Syria, deity itself had to give up its national limitation, and the new god of the Egyptians had to become like Pharaoh, the unique and unlimited sovereign of the world known to the Egyptians. Besides, it was natural that as the frontiers extended, Egypt should become accessible to foreign influences. Some of the king's wives were Asiatic princesses, and possibly even direct encouragement of monotheism had penetrated from Syria. Amenhotep never denied his accession to the sun cult of On. In the two hymns to Aten, which have been preserved to us through the inscriptions in the rock tombs and were probably composed by him. He praises the sun as the creator and preserver of all living beings in and outside Egypt with a fervor such as recurs many centuries after only in the Psalms in honor of the Jewish god Jave. But he did not stop at this astonishing anticipation of scientific knowledge concerning the effect of sunlight. There is no doubt that he went further, that he worshipped the sun not as a material object, but as a symbol of a divine being, whose energy was manifested in his rays. But we do scant justice to the king if we see in him only the adherent and protector of an Aten religion which had already existed before him. His activity was much more energetic. He added something new that turned into monotheism, the doctrine of an universal God, the quality of exclusiveness. In one of his hymns, it is stated in so many words, quotation, O oh, thou only God, there is no other God than thou, end of quotation. And we must not forget that to appraise the new doctrine, it is not enough to know its positive content only, nearly as important its negative side. The knowledge of what it is repudiates. It would be a mistake to, to suppose that the new religion sprang to life, ready and fully equipped like Athena out of Zeus' forehead. Everything rather goes to show that during Amenhotep's reign, it was strengthened so as to attain greater clarity, consistency, harshness, and intolerance. Probably this development took place under the influence of the violent opposition among the priests of Amun that raised its head against the reforms of the king. In the sixth year of Amenhotep's reign, this enmity grown to such an extent that the king changed his name, of which the now prescribed name of the god Amun was a part. Instead of Amenhotep, he called himself Akhenaten, but not only from his name did he eliminate that of the hated god, but also from all inscriptions and even where he found it in his father's name, Amenhotep III. Soon after his change of name, Akhenaten left Thebes, which was under Amun's rule, and built a new capital, lower down the river, which he called Akhetaten, Horizon of Aten. Its ruins are now called Tel el Amarna. The persecution by the king was directed foremost against Amun, but not against him alone. Everywhere in the empire, the temples were closed, the services forbidden, and the ecclesiastical property seized. Indeed, the king's deal went so far as to cause an inquiry to be made into the inscriptions of old monuments in order to efface the word God whenever it was used in the plural. It is not to be wondered, these orders produced a reaction of fanatical vengeance among the suppressed priests and the discontented people, a reaction which was able to find a free outlet after the king's death. 
the Aten religion had not appealed to the people. It had probably been limited to a small circle round Akhenaten's person. His end is wrapped in mystery. We learn from a few short-lived shadowy successors of his own family. Already his son-in-law, Tut Ang Atun, was forced to return to Thebes and to substitute Amun in his name for the god Aten. Then there followed a period of anarchy until the general Harem Hub succeeded in 1350 in restoring order. The glorious 18th dynasty was extinguished. At the same time, their conquests in Nubia and Asia were lost. In this sad interregnum, Egypt's old religions had been reinstated. The Aten religion was at an end. Eknaton's capital lay destroyed and plundered, and his memory was scorned as that of a felon. It will serve a certain purpose if we now note several negative characteristics of the Aten religion. In the first place, all myth, magic, and sorcery are excluded from it. Then there is the way in which the sun god is represented, no longer as in earlier times, by a small pyramid and a falcon, but, and this is almost rational, by a round disk from which emanates rays terminating in human hands. In spite of all the love for art in the Amarna period, not one personal representation of the sun god Aten has been found, and we may say with confidence, ever will be found. Finally, there is a complete silence about the death god Osiris and the realm of the dead, neither hymns nor inscriptions on graves, no anything of what was perhaps nearest to the Egyptian's heart. The contrast with the popular religion cannot be expressed more vividly. Three, we venture now to draw the following conclusion. If Moses was an Egyptian, and if he transmitted to the Jews his own religion, then it was that of Eknaton, the Aten religion. We compared earlier the Jewish religion with the religion of the Egyptian people, and noted how different they were from each other. Now we shall compare the Jewish with Aten religion, and should expect to find that they were originally identical. We know that this is no easy task of the Aten religion. We do not perhaps know enough. Thanks to the revengeful spirit of the Ammon priests, the Mosaic religion we know only in its final form, as it was fixed by Jewish priests in the time after the exile, about 800 years later. If in spite of this unpromising material, we should find some indications fitting in with our supposition, then we may indeed value them highly. There would be a short way of proving our thesis that the Mosaic religion is nothing else but that of Aten, namely by a confession of faith, a proclamation. But I am afraid I should be told that such a route is impracticable. The Jewish creed, as is well known, says, quotation, schema Jizurel Adonai Elohinu Adonai Ichud, end of quotation. If the similarity of the name of the Egyptian Aten to the Hebrew word Adonai and the Syrian divine name Adonis is not a mere accident but is the result of a primeval unity in language and meaning, then one could translate the Jewish formula. Hear, O Israel, our Aten, Adonai, is the only God. I am also entirely unqualified to answer this question and have been able to find very little about it in the literature concerned. But probably we had better not make things so simple. Moreover, we shall have to come back to the problems of the divine name. The points of similarity as well as those of difference in the two religions are easily discerned.
Eastern, but do not enlighten as much. Both are forms of a strict monotheism, and we shall be inclined to reduce to this basic character what is similar in both of them. Jewish monotheism is in some points even more uncompromising than the Egyptian. For example, when it forbids all visual representation of its God, the most essential difference apart from the name of their God is that the Jewish religion entirely relinquishes the worship of the sun, to which the Egyptian one still adhered. When comparing the Jewish with the Egyptian folk religion, we received the impression that besides the contrast in principle, there was in the difference between the two religions an element of purposive contradiction. This impression appears justified in our comparison. We replace the Jewish religion by that of Aten, which Ignaton, as we know, developed and delivered antagonism to the popular religion. We were astonished, and rightly so, that the Jewish religion did not speak of anything beyond the grave, for such a doctrine is reconcilable with the strictest monotheism. This astonishment disappears if we go back from the Jewish religion to the Aten religion and surmise that this feature was taken over from the last since for Ignaton it was a necessity in fighting the popular religion where the dead god Osiris played perhaps a greater part than any god of the upper region. The agreement of the Jewish religion with that of Aten in this important point is the first strong argument in favor of our thesis. We shall see that it is not the only one. Moses gave the Jews not only a new religion, it is equally certain that he introduced the custom of circumcision. This has a decisive importance for our problem, and it has a hardly ever been weighed. The biblical account, it is true, often contradicts it. On the one hand, it dates the custom back to the time of the patriarchs as sign of the covenant concluded between God and Abraham. On the other hand, the text mentions in a specially obscure passage that God was wroth with Moses because he had neglected this holy usage and proposed to slay him as punishment. Moses' wife, a Midianite, saved her husband from the wrath of God by speedily performing the operation. These are distortions, however, which should not lead us astray. We shall explore their motives presently. The fact remains that the question concerning the origin of circumcision has only one answer. It comes from Egypt. Herodotus, the father of history, tells us that the custom of circumcision had long been practiced in Egypt, and in his statement has been confirmed by the examination of mummies and even by drawings on the walls of graves. No other people of the eastern Mediterranean has, as far as we know, followed this custom. We can assume with certainty that the Semites, Babylonians, and Sumerians were not circumcised. Biblical history itself says as much of the inhabitant of Canaan, it is presupposed in the story of the adventure between Jacob's daughter and the prince of Shechem, the possibility that the Jews in Egypt adopted the usage of circumcision in any other way than in connection with the religion Moses gave them may be rejected as quite untenable. Now let us bear in mind that circumcision was practiced in Egypt by the people as a general custom and let us adopt for the moment, the usual assumption that Moses was a Jew who wanted to free his compatriots 
from the service of an Egyptian overlord and led them out of the country to develop an independent and self-confident existence, a fiat he actually achieved. What sense could there be in his forcing upon them, at the same time a burden, some custom which, so to speak, made them into Egyptians and was bound to keep away their memory of Egypt, whereas his intention could only had the opposite aim, namely that his people should become strangers to the country of bondage and overcome the longing for the flesh puts of Egypt in quotation mark and question. No, the fact we started from and the suggestion we added to it are so incompatible with each other that we venture to draw the following conclusion. If Moses gave the Jews not only a new religion, but also the law of circumcision. He was no Jew, but an Egyptian. And then the Mosaic religion was probably an Egyptian one, namely because of its contrast to the popular religion, that of Aton, with which the Jewish one shows agreement in some remarkable point. As I remarked earlier, my hypothesis that Moses was not a Jew, but an Egyptian, creates a new enigma. What he did easily understandable if he were a Jew becomes unintelligible in an Egyptian. But if we place Moses in Ignaton's period and associate him with that pharaoh, then the enigma is resolved and a possible motive presents itself. Answering all our questions, let us assume that Moses was a noble and distinguished man, perhaps indeed a member of the royal house. As the myth has it, he must have been conscious of his great abilities, ambitious and energetic. Perhaps he saw himself in a dim future as the leader of his people, the governor of the empire. In close contact with Pharaoh, he was a convinced adherent of the new religion, whose basic principles he fully understood and had made his own. With the king's death and the subsequent reaction, he saw all his hopes and prospects destroyed. If he was not to recant the convictions so dear to him, then Egypt had no more to give him. He had lost his native country. In this hour of need, he found an unusual solution. The dreamer Ignaton had strange himself from his people had let his world empire crumble. Moses' active nature conceived the plan of founding a new empire, of finding a new people, to whom he could give the religion that Egypt disdained. It was, as we perceive, an heroic attempt to struggle against his fate, to find compensation in two directions for the losses he had suffered through Ignaton's catastrophe. Perhaps he was at the time governor of that border province, Gusen, in which perhaps already in the Hyksos period certain Semitic tribes had settled. These he chose to be his new people, an historic decision. He established relations with them, placed himself at their head, and directed the exodus by strength of hand in full contradistinction to the biblical tradition. We may suppose this exodus to have passed off peacefully and without pursuit. The authority of Moses made it possible, and there was then no central power that could have prevented it. According to our construction, the exodus from Egypt would have taken place between 1358 and 1350. That is to say, after the death of Ignaton, the restitution 
of the authority of the state by Harim Hab. The goal of the wandering could only be Canaan. After the supremacy of the Egypt had collapsed, hordes of warlike Arameans had flooded the country, conquering and pillaging, and thus had shown where a capable people could seize new land. We know these warriors from the letters which were found in 1887 in the archives of ruined city of Amarna. There they are called Habiru and the name was passed on, no one knows how, to the Jewish invaders. Hebrews who came later and could not have been referred to in the letters of Amarna, the tribes who were the most nearly related to the Jews now leaving Egypt also lived South Palestine in Canaan. The motivation that we have surmised for the Exodus as whole covers also the institution institution of circumcision. We know in what manner human beings, both peoples and individuals, react to this ancient custom, scarcely any longer understood. Those who do not practice it regard it as very odd and find it rather abhorrent. But those who have adopted circumcision are proud of the custom. They feel superior, ennobled, and look down with contempt at the others who appear to them unclean. Even today, the Turk hurls abuse at the Christian by calling him an uncircumcised dog. It is credible that Moses, who as an Egyptian was himself circumcised, shared this attitude. The Jews with whom he left his native country were to be a better substitute for the Egyptians he left behind. In no circumstances must they be inferior to them. He wished to make of them a, in quotation mark, holy people. So it is explicitly stated in the biblical text, and as a sign of their dedication, he introduced the custom that made them at least the equals of the Egyptians. It would further be welcome to him if such a custom isolated them and prevented them from mingling with other foreign peoples they would meet during their wanderings, just as the Egyptians had kept apart from all foreigners. Jewish tradition, however, behaved later on as if if it were oppressed by the sequence of ideas we have just developed. To admit that circumcision was an Egyptian custom introduced by Moses would be almost to recognize that the religion handed down to them from Moses was also Egyptian, but the Jews had good reasons to deny this fact. Therefore, the truth about circumcision had also to be contradicted. See you next episode.